Rob to the Ladies Working Dog Group, Society Group. So um, without further ado, I shall uh, introduce you to the wonderful Robert Elaine, who I've had the pleasure of knowing now for almost seven years. Um, known him since before I became a professional dog trainer, and it's all his fault that I am one. Um, <laughs> So um, we've got some amazing questions from everybody being sent in, which is great, Rob. Sorry, we're going to keep you very busy. Good, good. Um, we've got lots and lots of questions. At the end, as long as we've got some time, guys, the plan is to um, give you the opportunity if any questions crop up, um, to pop your hands up, and Gemma will be looking out for that around that time um, for the last 15 minutes, see if there are any additional questions. Um, Rob, would you like to introduce yourself to the ladies? I'm Robert Elaine. I'm a dog behavioural trainer. Have been for 30 years plus, something like that, since I was in my early teens. Um, uh, yeah, I kind of, it's my passion. It's what I've done for many, many years as a hobby and then kind of just decided I would take the plunge and do it full time and I've been doing that since 2007. 2006-2007. Yeah, so I go out, my day is filled with going out and meeting people with problem dogs, although not so much now, and trying my best to fix it. Yeah, brilliant. And you've done quite a lot of really interesting stuff, and and a couple of the questions come back to that, so I won't cover those now. But um, you were on TV, weren't you? On Dog (laughs) Wars. I was. (laughs) Um, I wonder how many of the ladies on here uh, this evening have seen you on Dog Forstall. That was quite oh, something. It was a long time ago, you know. It was 2006 to 2009. So it was a long time ago. A lot of these people won't have been born by then. <laughs> <laughs> We're wishing. <laughs> We're wishing. <laughs> so we will kick off then, sir. So... One of the first questions was, have you always loved dogs and when did your passion for dog training start? Uh, yes, yes. I've always been animal mad, all animals really, right from when I was very, very small. I was mad about animals and particularly dogs. And, and it was pretty weird in my family because none of them, my mum and dad used to say I was adopted because if they couldn't eat it to them, what was the point in having an animal? You know, they didn't get pets. They didn't get you know, companionship and all that, that was people. Animals were animals and um, none of my siblings are like it. Um, so, but always, right, when I, when I was too small to have proper pets, I used to have beetles and snails and spiders and things that I used to keep in little containers. So yeah, it's always been a thing. Mm-hmm. But dogs was, was always the ones I loved the most. But my mum wouldn't let me have a dog as a, as a small child. So we didn't have them growing up, we had cats. My dad liked cats, so we had a cat. And we always had cats. But um, yeah, dogs, uh, my first dog was when I was 12. And um, my, no, when I was nine, we got him. And he was my sister's dog. And she got him from a pet shop, as people did in those days. You walk past a pet shop, saw a puppy in the window, you just went and bought it. And my sister got my mother to buy it. And right from the day he came to the front door, he was kind of my dog. But my mother absolutely hated him, hated him with a passion. And, um, and then when I was 12, she got rid of him. She got the RSPCA to come and take him away on Christmas Eve, can you believe? Um, and it's some really I, shocked faces right now. <laughs> honestly, it, was, it, it traumatized me. And um, she used to keep threatening to get rid of him because she, she did, just didn't like him. And um, so then I was at home with my brother on Christmas Eve and there was a ring on the doorbell and I opened the door and there's this RSPCA inspector on the doorstep saying, I've come to collect your dog. And everybody knew about it except me. And um, so I was like, no, I, you must have the wrong address. You know, no, anyway, it turned out they wanted him and they took him and he wouldn't go with them. So I had to, I had to take him out on a lead and put him in this woman's van and watch him as she drove away with him looking out the window it was horrible it was just horrible and um so then when i was 18 she finally agreed to let me have another dog and i was so worried that if he wasn't perfect she would get rid of him i thought this dog has got to be the best behaved dog ever so i found a dog training class for every night of the week Monday to Friday. <laughs> i was at the dog training class 
um, because I just thought he's got to be perfect. And so perhaps ironically, it was her getting rid of that dog that made me work so hard at dog training mm. because I thought the next dog just had to be perfect. So I really slogged at it. And then it kind of all came about from there, really. It just kind of kept snowballing and getting bigger and bigger and bigger and like me until I'm, I'm here. So how did you get into running your first class? So I started going to a friend's dog training class um, in Southwark. And it was, uh, in those days, they used to run them as part of the adult education program. And so she was running this evening class. And I was just a pupil in the class. I was only 22, 23, something like that. And then one day she just announced that she didn't want to run the class anymore and that she wanted me to take it over. And, you know, I'd never even considered running a dog training class with you. I was like, no, no, I can't, I can't run the class. I can't run the class. I'm the youngest, weakest student in the class. I can't run it, you know. And she said, well, if you don't take it over, I'm going to close it. And wow. so everybody in the class then started telling me I had to take it over so that it wouldn't close. And so I suddenly went from being this pupil in the class to running a class and hadn't got a clue how to run a class. <laughs> Didn't know the person <laughs> um, So I just kind of tried to repeat what I'd seen her do. And then suddenly I was running my first dog training class. Wow. And as they say, the rest is history. <laughs> the rest, as they say, yeah. Um, I mean, I look back now and they were pretty awful classes, but it was the way people ran them at the time. So the exercises were very, very kind of traditional and old school. It was all compulsion. You, you basically made the dog do it. You weren't supposed to reward them and treat them and stuff. And that sort of thing had really only just started to come about the concept that you could reward good behavior, but it was still pretty compulsive in those days. And that was how classes were run. So I just kind of repeated parrot fashion what I'd been taught. And it, you know, it ticked along okay. It went on for a, a good few years. But yeah, so there was a lot that needed to change. Wow. Amazing. So on to another question. What is your favourite breed of dog to work with and why? Oh, God. I'd love to know um, who asked that. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose I, I like a dog that's a little bit challenging. I, um, I... I don't like dogs that just are too, too, too keen to work. I like a dog who says, well, do I really want to do that? And, and because that pushes me to work harder. Uh -huh. And so the, 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 my favorite dog that I ever worked, my, my German shepherd that I had, I think the reason I liked her best was because she really was very self-serving. And so I had to make sure that she wanted to do what I wanted her to do. Otherwise, she wasn't going to do it. And I learned so much more with that dog. And they say that, you know, if you get a difficult dog, you'll learn more with that dog than you ever learn with the easy one. Yeah. And she was a, a difficult dog. Um, but I learned so much more with her. And she ended up being my best working dog because it forced me to have to think outside of numerous boxes. This is not going to work with her. Um, so she was probably my favorite. But in terms of breeds or types of dogs, I don't think I'm that fussy, really. I, I like a dog that gives me a bit of a challenge. I, yeah. I don't like my last dog. He was the nicest dog that I ever had. But he was so good that, and I loved him dearly, but he, he was a little bit boring because he always <laughs> just said, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. And there was no challenge. And I used to sometimes just wish he'd just go, I don't want to do that. I don't want to do it. But he just would look at me and go, whatever makes you happy makes me happy. Um, so, I, yeah, as a, probably the trainer in me likes to have a dog that, that has to be trained. That well, challenges you mentally a little absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Cool. But breed-wise, I'm, I'm really not fussy. Yeah. Okay, good choice. <laughs> so, <laughs> if you're breed. allowed to talk about it, and I don't know if you are, but if you're allowed to talk <laughs> no, about it. I wonder where it, this is going. <laughs> in your work with the CPS and the courts, what has been your most interesting case? My most interesting case? Mm. I mean, they're all very interesting, um, but, but I, I tend not to do them anymore because it, it's pretty, it can be really upsetting. And um, there have been several cases where I've gone in and my job is an expert witness. So I'm usually called in by the court. So I'm impartial and they'll have usually seized a dog already. Um, and they want me to go and assess the dog and deem whether or not it's dangerous. You know, it may have already committed an act, but they want to know whether or not the dog represents a danger to public safety or whether or not this was just a one-off. And those are the ones that I, I probably like best because then I'm impartial. I, I don't have to sit on either side of the fence. 
Mm. Um, so I'll just be called in and my job is simply to assess the dog and deem whether or not it's dangerous. And obviously dangerous is an incredibly subjective thing. So I have to look at the case and see what happened and then see whether or not the dog is likely to do that or something worse again. So the tests you do are dependent on kind of what happened. Um, but the, the, the most difficult ones, and one of the reasons why I don't like doing them anymore is sometimes the courts want to make an example of the person or occasionally the dog, but usually the person. Right. So there have been cases where you go in and right from day one, you know, it really doesn't matter what you say. They're probably going to put the dog to sleep. And then it doesn't matter how good your evidence is. You can kind of get a sense for the ones where you think, well, they just really want me to tick that box. And then it really doesn't matter what I say. They're going to find some way to slant it to make sure that they get to put the dog to sleep. Yeah. So often in cases where the police have got a particular issue with the owner, he may be a guy with a uh, form already, um, they want to punish him and put the dog to sleep. And I've had a few like that where they've really seized the dog just because they know it's going to hurt the guy to seize the dog. And then they don't want me to find that dog innocent. They want that dog put to sleep. And you can sometimes get a feel for it and you know it really doesn't matter. And, and those are pretty tough. I, I, you know. But of course, you don't know until you go in there whether or not that's going to be the case. So you walk in thinking, I've got really good evidence for this case. And then you go in and the judge starts talking or the CPS starts talking and you know, I'm not going to get this dog out. It's not going to happen. And those are the ones that are the, the toughest. So I, I tend to refer a lot of that work on now. I, I've done my stint at it. But it can be very, very upsetting. Sometimes. Yeah, it must be quite emotionally draining to deal with it those is. situations. It is. Well, you know, I was an animal welfare officer for 16 years. And my job was to save animals. And now sometimes I'm asked to examine this dog. And the conclusion is that the dog is dangerous. And so now, now I've got to go into court and tell this judge that I think this dog is dangerous and shouldn't go there. And I see the owners crying and everything, and it's awful. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think I've done my stint of, of that. So I, I, I'm probably not going to do any more of those. It's too disgusting. Don't blame you. <laughs> I'll leave it to you, young. Uh, okay. Well, we'll make you laugh now then. Oh, that's good. <laughs> so what we would like to know from you, Rob, is what is your funniest story from Dog Forstall? <laughs> Oh, there were lots of those. Um, I have to say, it was the most fun. It was a little bit mad. Um, every day you're kind of there, you're thinking, this is a little bit weird. Um, but we had some really good fun. Um, so a particular one that, that made me laugh was there, there was a woman there, she had a border collie named Nikki. And um, well, she was named Nikki. Uh, and uh, she really just didn't kind of get what a dog was at all so this dog bit everybody it was really pretty aggressive it had bitten all of her family the only person it didn't bite was her anyone who came to the house it would bite them her son husband they'd all been bitten by this dog but she just kind of didn't see that this was the dog's problem at all it was all their fault well if you hadn't come through the door he wouldn't have bitten you <laughs> and um and i remember us having a conversation where i was trying to get her to understand that he was a dog, which is a really good thing to be. He's not a person. And um, somehow we got onto the subject of, oh yeah, I remember, because she used to sit with him in the evening and talk through the TV guide, and she swore blind that he chose what they would watch. <laughs> and I said, well, he really can't do that because he's a dog, you know, he, he doesn't know. And I said, you know, are you saying that he would look through and go, oh, let's watch Coronation Street? Because he doesn't know what Coron Coronation Street is. And she went, well, okay. He probably doesn't know who Curly Watts is. She's, and this is what she said. She said, but he probably knows he works in a supermarket. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> you think he knows what a supermarket is? You know? And she, at the end, she said, yeah, I've worked for a week with Rob. Lovely guy, she said. Doesn't know the first thing about dogs. <laughs> no! That's not the first thing about dogs. I oh, see both up, but there was one, perhaps the one that sticks in my mind most, there was a guy named Hugo, and he had two dogs, a um, Manchester Terrier and a Jack Russell, Ingie and Bertie. And um, he was <laughs> a colourful character. But the, the, the thing that I remember most about him was on the first day, and I would say it was one, certainly one show that I know that really what you saw was what you got. There was no clever editing or stuff going on. What you saw was what was happening. 
Yeah. And so as they arrive, the first thing they have to go into the vet's office and have the dog checked out the vet. Um, and then the dogs are deemed okay, and then the vet gives you some poo bags and an antiseptic hand wash. And then after that, you have to walk up to the kennel block, which is probably about a five, six, seven minute walk. And so he's checked his dogs in, they're fine, and we're walking up to the kennels, and I'm supposed to be talking through what's going to be happening, and da 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 So we're walking up to the kennels, and his dog, the Jack Russell, does a poo on the grass. And I said, um, you're going to have to pick that up if you've got your poo bag. And he said, oh, I've left them in the vet's office. And I said, okay, well, make a note of where it is, and you'll have to come back and pick it up. And he went, oh, don't worry about that. And he just bent down, and he just scooped it up in his hand. <laughs> And then just proceeded to walk off carrying it in his hand. And I, I couldn't even speak to us. So I just kind of watched him walking away. And the camera is shaking because the cameraman's laughing at the kind of horror on my face. And um, I said to the camera, I said something like, um, I know I'm supposed to be walking along, talking him through, but I'm, I'm just having a hard time getting around the fact that he's walking along with a handful of poo. And, and I don't really know how to do that. Anyway, so he walked up to the kennels. We got to the kennel block and right across the front of the kennel block, there's all these big wheelie bins with dog waste written on them. And so we get there and he turns to me and he just starts talking. Okay, so, and he's still got this thing like this and he's going, so, you know, what, what are we going to do next? And so, I said, Hugo, the first thing we have to do is you have to get rid of the poo. I really can't have a conversation with you until you get rid of the poo. Well, of course, he's been carrying it now for five minutes. And so when he goes to drop it in the bin, he's like, It was horrible. It was just horrible. His hand was browner than mine, you know. And, um, and then, once he'd got the majority of it, he just bent down and started wiping his hand on the grass. And just, it was just horrific. Horrific. Oh, no! Um, so yeah, Hugo sticks in my mind. He was an um, interesting character. He said that when his dogs poo on the bed, he doesn't bother to get rid of it. He just slides in under the duvet and just leaves it there. Um, and, um, and eventually he gets around to removing it all. But he said there can be sort of 10 or 12 piles of poo on the bed and he gets in it. It's obviously all on TV as well. He's, yeah, this is on, on national television, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mick, Mick looked in his car and um, Mick took 35 bags of poo out of his car. He used to carry them back to the car with him when he took the dogs for a walk, throw them in the car, and then just leave them there. And then the next day he'd take them and just never kind of quite got round to getting rid of them, you know? I'm not often speechless, but <laughs> I think I am. <laughs> but the weird thing is, he was such a nice guy. He was a really nice <laughs> guy. He was just too comfortable with poop, you know, just, just, they were just like best friends. It was too familiar. So that took some, some getting used to. And you, you're with them for four days. And um, so we had lots of kind of very interesting chats. But he was the, the guy whose dog I took off him. Right. He loved the Manchester Terrier, but he was so horrible to the Jack Russell all the time. It could do no right. You know, like you get some parents who just don't like one of the children. Well, that was what he was like with this Jack Russell. And over the course of the week, there was twice we had to stop filming because I thought I was going to hit him, where he'd done things that I just thought was unacceptable. And I said, okay, we've got to stop now. You've got to get him out of my sight because I'm really struggling with him. And then at the end of the, the week, I just thought, I can't let him take that dog home because he's been abusing it all this time and he'll continue to be, not because he's a horrible person, but he just doesn't quite see the world the way everybody else does. And I thought, I, I can't let him take that dog home. So I said to him, look, um, I need you to relinquish Henry to me, uh, Bertie to me. I'm going to take him and have another home. You, you can't have him. It's, it's just not right. And, and um, anyway, I managed to get him to agree to relinquish him to me. And I found him another home, um, which was the perfect home for him. It was so good. And, um, and so that was the end of him. So, so yeah, he was the most um, interesting character I think we had. Yes, interesting um, is the word. <laughs> but of course, the whole thing about the show was that BBC picked the people that come on it. And obviously, yeah. the weirder they are, the more eccentric they are, the more likely they were to make it onto the show, because what they wanted was an entertainment program. And yeah. those of you who watched it, will realise some of those people were very, you know, Hugo was great entertaining. Mad as a box of frogs, but, you know, but very entertaining. 
Wow. Well, before we go into some, I'm like, wow. <laughs> before we go into some, we've got some really cool questions here from the ladies, um, behaviour type stuff and that. But before we do, just what was your biggest success story personally from Dog Forstall? Oh, wow. Um, oh, oh, there was, um, there was a woman, she was in her 80s, Dorothy, and she had a borzoi. Um, and she was tiny, tiny. She was about five one. She was about eight stone wet. And she had this massive great borzoi that um, hated the traffic, terrified of traffic. He was fearful of people and other dogs. And what would happen is she'd be walking him in the woods by where she lived and somebody would appear and he would just take off. And she never let him off the lead because she knew he would disappear. Um, and he would just drag her. And I mean, he dragged her along on her belly and just pulled her up the road and stuff. He pulled her in front of cars and it, it was terrible. And um, he'd broken her hip uh, where he pulled her over one time and stuff. And um, so it was really quite serious, you know, because something terrible was going to happen. And he was a lovely dog. He was just terrified of everything. But she was on a week when we had two other particularly challenging, difficult people. And I got Dorothy. And I'm thinking, oh my God, I've got four days to try and get this dog's fear out of him as much as possible and get this woman to be able to walk him before she goes home. And on day one, she, because um, the owners get to meet each other first and they spend the, the previous evening getting to know each other and all. And the morning she came up to my office where we, where we actually meet. And she said, listen, she said, I've been listening to the other two. They're not here to work. They're not going to get anywhere. They've come here to have a good time. And da, 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 da. she said, you tell me what to do and I will do it. I'm going to be the first one up there. I'm going to be first at the kennel. I'm going to do every single thing you tell me. And she was amazing, amazing. Um, all the others were complaining because the food was cold and the showers were cold and they didn't like getting up. She was always first up with her dog, first out, first up to work her dog. She did absolutely everything. And we threw the lot at her for her test. I thought, okay, I believe she can do it. So I'm going to throw everything. We threw traffic. He had a phobia of chickens. He was even the sound of chickens on the telly, he would run out of the room. I even put chickens in her test. He had to recall pasts and chickens and we did everything. And um, she got one of the highest scores we'd ever had on the show. She got like 95, 96 or something out of 100 um, because she just got on with it. And uh, she used to send me videos of him afterwards walking down the street beautifully and recalling. She was able to let him off the lead. So. And it was because she signed up to get the work done. I'm here to work. She said, I'm not here to mess about everything you tell me I'm going to do. And she worked so hard. So, so I suppose that was probably in some ways my most successful, but certainly one of the ones I enjoyed the most because it was lovely to know that she was safe now. You know, her and her dog were safe, that something terrible wasn't going to happen. And, and that was a situation where it was just a matter of time before something terrible did happen. Yeah. So, so yeah, that was one of my, my favourites and, and okay. yeah, one of the big turnarounds. We had lots of aggressive dogs on the show. We probably had more aggressive dogs than anything else. And obviously when you turn around an aggressive dog, it's great and it's potentially life-saving. But that dog, through no malintent, was probably going to kill that one one day. Yeah. You know, and yeah. pulled her out into the road or, or she fell and injured herself. And um, yeah, so that one meant a lot. Yeah. And she, she died a few years back. And we were still in touch. I'm still in touch with quite a few of the people up here. But we were still in touch then. She got another dog and she contacted me and she got him and said, I want to make sure this one doesn't end up like him. And yeah, yeah, it was lovely. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Are you ready, sir? I'm going to read this one because this is quite a long question. Okay. <laughs> How best to overcome teenager dominance around other dogs? Don't want it turning into aggression. Had a couple of near misses out of the blue, standing over and growling at other dogs. Currently back on the lead when around, but so many dogs where we live. Not always possible to avoid completely. And I don't want to muzzle. She doesn't want to muzzle, I think. No issues with people and complete softy and well behaved 90, 95% of the time. Okay. So if we start with the beginning, dogs are almost never dominant. Dominant is, dominant is incredible rare. A dog may try and assert itself in a position, a particular situation. It might think it can take advantage of a situation, but dominance in dogs is actually pretty rare. Um, what you see with most dogs is they're actually fearful, and we call it dominance because they're kind of bullies. 
but it's usually based in fear. Um, so if you look at you know, a wolf pack or a, um, a group of wolves or a, a, a bears or lions, any of those that periodically come together and kind of war, then you'll see a lot of what we traditionally would call dominant behavior. But there's very little aggression in dominance. It's all about posturing and, and trying to intimidate. And then aggression really kind of comes along at the end. What we tend to see with a lot of dogs is dogs who learn that attack is the best form of defense. But, and those dogs are then often misconstrued as being dominant. But really, they're not. They're just trying to keep themselves safe. So I probably see maybe, maybe three dominant dogs a year. Wow. But I see dozens who were labeled as dominant who actually weren't at all. They're just trying to keep themselves safe. Um, so probably this is not a dominant dog. It's not trying to assert itself. It's just trying to keep itself safe. So they do a lot of blood. I'll run over and talk big and tough. Da, 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 da. But they very rarely get really aggressive. They don't really get into big fights where you have to pull them apart and so on because they didn't really want to have a fight in the first place. They just wanted to intimidate the other dog into backing off. So it's probably more, more that sort of thing. Again, often we find this at teenage stage, just like humans, when you start pushing the boundaries, how far can I go? What can I get away with? Um, and dogs often do the same thing. So they'll be misconstrued as being dominant. The reason why that's important is because what people then try and do is run a dominance reduction program on a dog who isn't dominant in the first place. Yeah. So they waste months or even years trying to train it using a technique that's never going to work because it's like trying to give a cough remedy to somebody who's got a cold. You know, it just doesn't fix it. So that would be the first thing I'd, I would want to work with them on is make sure that the dog actually is dominant and isn't actually probably fearful. So that would be the first thing you look at. But if the dog is fearful, what I always want to look at then is the relationship between the owner and the dog that makes the dog think when I'm in a situation where I'm fearful, instead of turning to you and saying, can you get me out of this? What I need to do is deal with it myself. So usually there's something not quite right in the relationship between the owner and the dog where the dog thinks I have to protect myself. I can't rely on you to keep me safe. And then the owner finds that even if they try and intervene, the dog won't listen because it's already learned that I have to deal with this myself. The owner then wants to try and teach the dog to listen to them. So when they say, leave that dog or leave that cat or leave that thing that you're trying to go after, the dog doesn't listen. Well, because he'd learned not to listen over a whole barrage of other things. And so lots of owners will tell me their dog's problem is he's aggressive or he's pulling on the lead or he's got a separation anxiety. But almost always, the real problem the dog has is that he's not listening. He knows that the owner wants him to come back or get down or drop that. But he says in this scenario, I don't have to listen. And so as a trainer, what I always have to look at first of all is what's going wrong in their relationship that's making the dog not want to listen. And once we train him that he has to listen, then when they say don't run after that dog or don't have a go at that dog or leave that thing alone or drop that, suddenly the dog starts to do it. Most of the dogs that I'm called to see that are said to have training problems actually have listening problems. They're already trained. They know exactly what the owner's asking them to do. They're just not doing it. So we have to look at why he's not doing it. So with a dog like that, what I would say is they really should get somebody to come out and work with them to find out why that dog feels so anxious in that situation, why it's not looking to them for guidance on how to behave, and then how to fix it. And once you put those things in place, really only then can you start to, to deal with that level of arousal. You know, the dog that does that is in a really aroused state. And if you haven't got a relationship with the dog where it learns to listen to you, you can't intervene because the dog's not listening. Mm -hmm. You know, it's just like those of you who've got male partners, I'm gonna slag men up a lot. Now. Um, when you try and talk to him when he doesn't want to listen, he can't even hear, especially <laughs> if he's angry or over aroused, and you're saying, darling, don't shout out of the window at that man. He's gone past in his car now. No, there's no need for road rage. Let it go. He can't even hear you. He's too busy going, yeah, next time I'll see. Yeah. It's too late. It's too late. He's, his arousal is too high for him to listen to. And that's kind of what happens with the dog. He's going, rawr, 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 rawr. you've got to have a really pretty high level of control and a really good relationship with that dog to be able to intervene and say, oh, can you be quiet, please? And have the dog listen. So that's the first thing you've got to look at in that situation is to get that dog wanting to listen to you better. And then you can think, okay, now you're listening to me. Can I get you to stop barking at that dog? Brilliant. Yeah. Thank you. That was awesome. So if they haven't got anyone and you're, you're one of the people on here, get in touch with a, a, a behavioral trainer. Um, there's one here, um, her name, Claire something or another. Claire something, Dennis, <laughs> something like that anyway. 
she, she's not bad. Um, give her, give her a call. You're a funny man. You're a uh, funny man. <laughs> Um, yeah, right, so just for that, I'm going to challenge you. Just for that, I'm going to challenge yeah, you. Yeah, thank you, because you weren't going to already. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this question comes in. These are all anonymous, by the way. I have no idea who these are from. Um, I have a small cocker spaniel. It's nine kilograms, by the way. It's very small. And she struggles to carry heavier um, one-pound dummies very far, although does try. Bless, I actually have images of that. That's sweet. Also struggles to pick up large pheasants. Have tried working up from tennis balls to half pound dummies. How do I get her to carry heavier comfortably without making her reluctant retreat? She's very keen at the moment and don't want to jeopardise that. Well, that's probably one one for you, your gun dog trainer. <laughs> <laughs> no, Rob's not a gun dog trainer. <laughs> I'm not a gun dog trainer. Um, there, there's a couple of things. As a, as a general dog trainer, there's a couple of things I might want to do, but she should probably be speaking to you more. But one of the things I'd probably want to work on is improving the dog's uh, body strength. So I'd want to work, get, get it to do stuff where it has to work on its front end, its neck and its shoulders. I might get it doing lots more swimming and things like that to increase that strength so that it, it feels less of a weight to it. But of course, the trouble is if the dog doesn't want to pick it up, it says that's just too heavy, I don't want to. That's really your problem because you can get a Jack Russell half that dog size will carry a badger you know because he wants to so that's what i'd be looking at is why doesn't the dog want to and and the traditional thing would be to move in ever increasing weights so you start with with the, the maximum the dog is comfortable with and then gradually build it up but what people tend to do is they move it too quickly and they go okay she's all right with this one let's do a kilo and a half and she says no it's too heavy so i would want to only work on that level until the dog was really keen to carry that level and then i'd increase it a little bit more and you're going to have to play the longer game, but what it means is you'll get a dog who wants to do it. But if you go too far, you'll just put the dog off. And, and as she says, there's the risk then it won't want to carry much of anything. So I would say take your time, work on the dog's core strength, make the dog physically stronger and more comfortable. It's less of an ordeal to carry bigger stuff and gradually increase. I might also play um, some little tugging games with the dog, encouraging it to, to work harder at hanging on to something. So it's less keen to drop stuff. Obviously with gun dogs, you have to be careful about doing too much of that. You don't want to create a dog with a hard mouth, but I'd want to try and increase the dog's desire to want to hold stuff. That well, work. I think you should add gum dog trainer to your <laughs> many no, years. Well, I'm going to leave that to the experts. Yeah, I know when I'm out. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Rob, how would you go about introducing a new pup to a well established pack? Ooh. Yeah, so that's quite a complicated one because it all depends on the puppy and it all depends on the pack. And it's one of those ones that there's really no answer for, because when you've got a group of dogs, even if there's, for argument's sake, there's three, even if two of them really like the puppy, all it needs is for one of them to not, and the dynamic is upset. The most common problem, and the most reason why there's problems, is because people kind of appear to the other dogs to favor the puppy. Now you be careful, don't you hurt that puppy? Don't you be rough with that puppy? Don't you hurt that puppy? And the existing dogs can start to think, well, hang on, it seems like dad is supporting this puppy a bit more. The puppy seems to be able to get away with a lot of stuff, and I seem to have started getting in trouble. So one of the tough things to do, if you've got a, a, a group of dogs who aren't already too hostile, is to let them put the puppy in its place. And even if it's the adult dog's fault, you as the owner still chastise the puppy. So the puppy just comes over to say hello to one of the other dogs. The dog goes, ah! And our temptation is to go, oh, don't do that, don't do that. He only came to say hello. And what it appears to do is support the puppy and malign the existing dog. So what I do in that situation is I have a go at the puppy as well. Leave him alone. Don't go bullying him. He didn't want to be told for. And it shows the existing dog that I support him. So there's less reason then to want to resent the puppy. But it's so much a lottery. Whenever you bring a new puppy in, because it depends about the, the, the drive in that particular puppy and the existing dogs and whether or not that's going to work. And I've dealt with lots of cases where people have brought in a puppy and the exi existing dog or dog despises it. I'm working with one now actually like that and her dog absolutely despises this puppy. Won't even be in the same room. But she doesn't want to get rid of the puppy and obviously she loves the existing dog so we're mm. trying to make that work. Mm. But I'd say again it's one of those ones that you probably really should get somebody to come out and look at your particular pack of dogs and this new puppy. You may have to introduce some of the dogs individually. You may have to create some coalitions with some dogs um, in support of the puppy so that they can help protect it from the other dogs. It's really one where there isn't a simple answer because it depends on the dynamic of each dog. 
It really does. And sometimes dogs really surprise you. You know, I always assumed after Indy's history that when I bought Rose, the youngest, into, into our household, you know, I almost forgot about dude in the situation. My thing was like, will Indy accept a third dog in? Their relationship's amazing. Dogs do yeah. surprise us, don't they? Yeah. Absolutely. And if you look at Indy, when, when Rose first came in, Indy was like, and what the hell is that? Why is that here? You know, uh, how long is it stopping for? What time is it? You know, um, and now look, and look at them now. And, and it surprised even you. It surprised me too. You know, how, how Rose is, how Indy has taken Rose really into the group. And then you'll get others who just absolutely who you assume they'll get on fine because they're great with other dogs in the park or whatever. And they absolutely hate this puppy. Um, a lot of people, and I can never quite understand the logic. They say, I got the puppy as company for the existing dog. Mm. And I always say, well, then be better company. That's your job. Not, not another dog <laughs> to provide the company for the dog. That's presumably why you bought it, was for company. So yeah. just be better company. But sometimes people make the mistake of getting a dog because they believe it will be company for the first dog. And all the existing dogs see is competition. Well, before, you were all mine. The toys were all mine. The food and water bottles were all mine. And now I've got to share them with this dog. And they absolutely hate it. They don't want to share. They, they like having it all for themselves. Mm. Um, statistically, true. you're much more likely to get um, aggression in same-sex dogs. So two bitches are much more likely to fight than two males. Uh, two bitches are also much more likely to fight seriously than two males. Males often will just kind of fight to prove a point. And once the point is proven, they kind of will coexist. Whereas bitches, particularly if they get to a state where they don't like each other, they'll more than not fight to the death. Um, one of them has to go. So you always want to try and get to them if it's bitches before they get to the point where they really hate each other because it's, it's extremely difficult to fix them. Mm. Um, whereas males, you can often get them to cope with. Um, I remember once working on a case with a German shepherd, a five-year-old German shepherd, bitch, and they had a 13-year-old little terrier. This shepherd was huge and this terrier was tiny, but because the shepherd had beaten the, um, had been beaten up by the terrier right from a puppy, the terrier ruled the room. She only had to look at the shepherd and hit the cow, even though it could have swallowed her. And then the woman decided to get a third dog, and she got a shepherd male. And very quickly, the two shepherds started to get on really, really well. And then suddenly, the shepherd bitch started attacking the terrier bitch badly, which she'd never done before. And it was because she felt now she had an ally. Mm -hmm. Now, he never intervened, he never got involved in the fight, but he didn't have to. Just her belief that she had somebody else in her corner now made her confident enough to then start attacking the terrier and so by the time the owner contacted me you know the terrier had been in surgery a couple of times she'd been really badly injured and she was worried that the shepherd was going to kill her and all we did in that situation was we suggested to the shepherd bitch that the shepherd male had now formed a new alliance with the terrier so we got them i got the owners to make them do everything together she walked those two together she put the shepherd out and fed those two together she made sure those two slept in the same room even though he had no interest in her and we tried to make it appear that he'd switched allegiances now and had joined forces with the shepherd uh, with the terrier we said you're not allowed to let the two shepherds play you can't walk them together you want it to seem as much as possible that he switched the league. and and all of the aggression stopped once she didn't believe she had an ally anymore she stopped attacking the other bitch so so there are ways again that you can do these things and i don't want to sound like i just keep saying the same thing but again in a situation like that you really should get somebody in one of the difficulties that I face, and I know you face as well, is people you don't know, with dogs you don't know, will contact you and say, how do I fix my dog? And the trouble is what works really well for one dog can be disastrous for another. So it's very difficult to say with any certainty what anybody should do with a dog that you've never met. Because it might be the best possible method for that dog or the worst. And there's, there's just no way of knowing. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Uh, leads really nicely on to this question. What would be your top tip? So it's got to be your best one. Okay. Not, not your second one, your top tip. I'll think about what it. Would, <laughs> what would be your top tip for a harmonious multi-dog male, multi-dog household, so three boys, when one has a strong resource guarding issue? Okay. Well, that's what I... <laughs> your best tip. Uh, I'm going to come up with... I'll have a drink first. I... <laughs> it is just water. <laughs> Because prior to the water, it would only be my second best, but I'm on fire now. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, the first thing you want to look at is how the dogs are when there isn't a resource issue. So you would want to look at the three dogs, the one who resource guards, where does he fit in within that trio? 
So if he's the, the kind of, for want of a better word, he's the top dog in that house, then really you've only got to look at his resource garden. But if he's perhaps the third, but is the most hostile when anyone goes near him when he's eating, this is probably much more a fear-based thing. And the only thing he feels brave enough, if you like, to show aggression on is around food. Um, so then I would want to look at that dog's insecurity. I'd want to look at so many other things, the diet that he's on. Why does he feel the need to guard resources? It might be that the diet doesn't suit him. So it can literally be as simple as he's hungrier because the food that he's eating transitions through him too quickly or he doesn't get enough nutrients from it. So he's much hungrier. So he's more likely to resource guard. Some dogs only resource guard novel things. So they're great with their food, but they'll be really aggressive over a bone. So you might simply need to look at, do I give this dog the, this animal, uh, this, this thing? Is it worth giving him bones if it's going to make him fight over them? Um, so I want to look at the relationship between the three dogs. I want to look at how badly the dog wants the thing. Is it something I can just train him out of, tell him to pack it in and he'll stop, which again comes down to the relationship between the owner and the dog. You can manage that situation by saying, okay, well, whenever I give them their bones, I'm going to give these two that are fine in this room, and I'm going to give him his out there. And of course, that can be the easiest way to resolve it. You just manage it. The downside of that, or the problem with that sometimes, and it doesn't say in the question you asked, is that sometimes dogs resource guard lots of, I've just been talking to somebody today whose dog will spontaneously resource guard almost anything. Yeah. Um, so, so she can't manage it because she never knows what he's going to suddenly start resource guarding. Um, she yeah. brought some cans of dog food today. She put them on the floor. He wouldn't let anyone near them. Um, sometimes they'll go and stand by a door. Nobody can go through the door. So, so with those sort of dogs, you can't manage around it. So it all depends on kind of what it is he's resource guarding, which the person doesn't say. Um, so I'd want to look at the relationship between the owner and the dogs. I'd want to look at the relationship between the dogs. I'd want to look at the dog's diet, see whether or not it's something that, that needs sorting out in his diet. And look at um, if it's a food item, how badly he needs that food. Does he need it or is it simply easy just to remove it? Um, so there's, again, so many different factors that you want to look at. You're going to need to look at, particularly if the dog is actually using aggression. Because if you get it wrong, one of the dogs maybe gets hurt, there's a massive great fight, now the dogs hate each other, now you can't have the dogs together. So I'm going to need to look at all those things again. So again, get them to give you or me a call, and we would look at all those things, and then I'd come up with the best possible answer. <laughs> <laughs> very clever, very clever. I'm just making something up. <laughs> oh, you've done this before. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I need to challenge you more clearly with my questions. <laughs> um, I would like some advice about how best to get my dog comfortable with other dogs approaching her when she is on a lead. She is three years old and used to be fine, but recently she has started to snarl and snap at other dogs who come up to her. She gets on fine with our other dog, and there hasn't been an episode where another dog has been aggressive towards her, but she seems to get very anxious about it. As a rule, I try not to let other dogs run up to us, but it does sometimes happen when owners haven't got control over their dogs. The horrible situations. So <clears throat> of the serious problems I'm called to see, um, this is the most common. And it sounds like what we call fear-based aggression. Um, so, when the dog is worse, when it's on the lead and it's very showy, it's almost always a fearful dog. What it's doing is going, don't come over here. If you come over here, I'm big and tough and I'll beat the living daylights out of you. And it's a bluff. It's designed to keep the other dog away. So almost certainly when you've got a dog who's barking when it's on the lead at other dogs, it's a fearful dog. It doesn't want the other dog to come over. There's a saying we use with people and the same applies with dogs. It's the quiet one. So they're the ones that you really have to worry about because they want the other dogs to come over so they can nail them. And the dogs I see that are dangerous when they get into a dog fight are not the ones who do lots of barking and growling because these are the ones who want you to come over. Back in my dog warden days, I was always much happier going into a house with a dog that barked at me than a dog that didn't. Mm. And occasionally I'd go into those houses and the dog would just be standing there looking at me, not moving. It's absolutely rigid. You think, okay, I'm probably going to get chewed up in a minute. Um, so it's the same with, dog, with, with dogs who go, ah, they're fearful. That's why they're worse when they're on the lead because they're trapped, they can't escape, they can't offer up a lot of the behaviours they would have offered if they were loose. So that's straight away a clue that this dog is fearful. Now she says that um, the dog has never been attacked, but of course it doesn't have to be. And this is a, a bit of a kind of a misconception about dogs who are aggressive towards other dogs, that he must have been attacked before. And that's not necessarily the case at all. He doesn't ever have to have been attacked. 
Um, he might never have even been had another dog show aggression to him. He just has to have been fearful. So if I sneaked up behind you and went, rah, <laughs> and made you jump, and you didn't know who I was, you'd probably scream and shout abuse at me. And it would probably upset you for a long time. You can see why it might make you sensitive if somebody else like me, same sort of side and build was coming towards you. It would maybe have an effect for a very long time. But I couldn't use it as a defense. Yes, but I never attacked you. I didn't have to. I only had to have frightened you. And the same can happen with dogs. So I actually got this young puppy who was never attacked. But maybe some dog was just too big and boisterous and kind of rolled it about a little bit in play. The owner thinks they're socializing, so doesn't worry about it. But that can be all it takes, just that one situation where that puppy became fearful to learn that it didn't trust other dogs. Then what happens is because we're all bullied into this socializing thing, which most of us get horribly wrong, um, we continue to allow our dog to be jumped on and wrestled with and bullied about by dogs that are bigger and stronger. And eventually what happens is the puppy or the young dog then snaps at one of them. And as soon as it does, everything changes. We grab it, we rescue it, we ask the other end to get the dog away, we pull our dog away. And he goes, wow, you've never defended me until I attacked another dog. I need to attack more dogs. That's the best way to get out of this situation. Roar and bark at them. As soon as I roar and bark at them, you defend me, but you don't defend me unless I do that. I'll do that more often. And of course it works very well. And the more hostile a dog becomes, the more we defend it, the more we create distance between other dogs, and so it reinforces that behavior. The best thing to do is to go for the other dog. So inadvertently, we can kind of feed into this. So then, because we think our dog will aggress towards other dog, then we make it even worse by grabbing the dog and putting it on the lead every time the dog appears. Now, if you look at any social group of animals, um, the first thing the group will do when it's threatened by something is close ranks. They come together. It's much easier to protect yourselves in a tight group. So now there's a dog appears over there. I go, oh, oh, Bonzo, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. And I grab them and I put them on the lead. And again, I'm reinforcing, wow, I get really anxious whenever another dog appears. As soon as another dog appears, I need you to close ranks with me. So of course then, that dog comes anywhere near us, my dog then starts barking. Because I've told him that other dogs are a real big problem. And I get lots of owners who think, so that lots of them, particularly with things like small dogs, who'll say, oh yeah, he doesn't like German Shepherds, Rottweilers, Dobermans, they don't like any big dogs really. And I said, how are you? Oh, they terrify me. I'm so worried they'll get them. And I said, is it funny how he dislikes all of the dogs that you dislike? How do you suppose <laughs> that happened, you know? And it's because inadvertently the owner said, those are the scariest ones. Whenever one of those appears, I have to grab the other one. And that's why often you see a little old lady with a poodle under her arm. You try and touch that dog, it will rip your arm off because she's <laughs> closed and to hold it in. And then you try and touch it. It'll nail you straight away. If it was on the floor, It'd be fine. <laughs> um, so yes, so her dog clearly has got a fear aggression issue. Um, I don't say reactivity because all dogs are reactive. Um, it's uh, what we call an aggressive display. And so what you would need to do again, look at her relationship with the dog. What you would want to try and do is reward the dog as much as possible around other dogs. So it starts to associate with, other, uh, with positive things and probably create some sort of consequences. And when I tell you to stop barking, you have to stop barking. And between those two things, when the dog realizes, if I don't bark, lots of good stuff happens, and you remove me from the other dog, I don't need to bark at other dogs anymore. But perhaps the most difficult thing, and you know this as well as I do, is trying to get the owner to be comfortable, say, excuse me, can you get your dog away, please? Oh yeah, he just wants to say, like, yeah, I really don't care, love. Can you get your dog away, please? My dog doesn't like other dogs. What a good boy you are. Oh, what's the more treat then? Um, so the dog starts to think, if I focus on you, you get rid of the other dog for me. I don't need to drive the other dog away. Brilliant. That was a very, very, very clever answer. Well done. <laughs> <Thank> um, <you. laughs> I've just been reading Training Dogs the Woodhouse. Right? I know. <laughs> okay, Rob. Well, so I have a four year old working cocker who will disappear at any opportunity. <laughs> oh, poor you. I don't know who it is, but I'm saying poor you. <laughs> it's me. It's me. I'm not <laughs> over you now. <laughs> It used to be that she would chase, but now it seems to be whenever she thinks she will get away with it. The latest thing being last Thursday when she disappeared on our walk for two and a half hours. Oh, oh crikey. My boy, sorry. <laughs> I'm like animating as I'm reading the question. Crikey. Um, once on a mission, nothing stops her. I don't want to give up on her, but I'm at a loss as to what to do now. I'd be very interested to hear any recommendations you have. I need a lifeline. Wow. Oh, I mean, that's a really serious, I mean, two and a half hours. 
you know. And, and I've got a very good friend who's a dog trainer who um, her dog used to go off wandering in the woods and she would let it because she always swore that he would find her and then one day he didn't and um, they found him dead in the road. So wow. it can be a very worrying thing when you've got a dog who will go outside. So again, there's something very wrong in their relationship. Um, that as soon as the dog, there's this funny thing, I don't know if you ever see it, um, hopefully none of you experience it, but I see this all the time in the park where people let their dog off the lead and the very first thing the dog does is run off. It doesn't even <laughs> know where it's it. going. You see those dogs who just run off like 20 yards away and then they have a good run around, they go, no, don't know, where are you, where are you? But their first thing is, I want to get away from you. I don't want to turn around and go, I've seen your dogs do it. They turn around and they go, mum, what are we doing now? Which is what you want. That's yeah. exactly what you want. And I see your dogs do that. But what a lot of people's dogs do is they go, I just need to be rid of you for a while and then I'll come back in a minute. And that to me always is the beginning of that problem where the dog says, instead of being a group that all go out together, I need to feel independent of you before I can even relate to you. So those are the dogs that often end up going further and further and further and further until they eventually run off. So there's something going wrong in their relationship that makes the dog think, as soon as you let me off the lead, I need to be anywhere except where you are. So that's really the problem. The problem is why the dog's not wanting to stay with the owner, why it's not thinking of the owner as the best place to be. In fairness, I think that a lot of the stuff we see online, and you know how I feel about that crap I see on YouTube and stuff, but a lot of it is designed to create the <laughs> who don't recall. I said that in a caring way, didn't I? Um, Very caring. <laughs> <laughs> but there's the so much you know, designed to make our dogs disinterested. You know, you've got to socialise your dog with other dogs, socialising with other dogs, socialise. You've got to socialise with other dogs, socialising with people. You've got to socialise and expose them. You've got to socialise. And what we end up, of course, with is dogs who don't want to be with us. All the fun is out there. They learn that everything is more interesting than you. You're just the one trying to catch them periodically. Um, whereas everything else that's fun is away from you. So of course we end up with dogs who don't want to recall. Um, almost always I find that dogs who don't recall have a whole host of listening problems and most of them stem from indoors. Most of those dogs, the owner, I'll, I'll say to them, how is he when, I, when, I, when people come to your house? Oh, he's very good. So he doesn't jump up. Oh yeah, yeah, he, he does jump up. And, and if you tell him to get down, do you get down? Oh, yeah, yeah, he gets down. Does he get down straight away? Well, well, no, I have to tell him a few times. On average, how many times? Mm. I mean, it probably does take sort of eight or nine times. And you've been telling him this for a couple of years now, and it still takes eight or nine times. Okay. What's he like around food? Oh, if you leave any food around, he will steal it. And how many times have you told him not to steal food? Oh, every single day, but the first chance to get. And so my thing is always, I need to look at what that dog's listening skills are like indoors, in the quietest, most insular environment that it has. And I'll bet you that dog doesn't listen reliably, even in their living room. But what they want it to do is listen reliably in the park, the place where it's least likely to want to listen, because there's so many reasons to not listen. So until you can get that dog reliably listening indoors, in every scenario where it understands, as soon as you speak, I have to listen. Until you can create that, you're never going to fix its recall. It says there are too many reasons to not recall, and I don't even listen to you on the little thing. And I guarantee if that person's got a dog who disappears from sight, it will have a whole host of listening problems. And until you address them all and teach it, no, actually, you have to listen to everything I say. Until you create that, you're not going to have a dog who recalls. And, and it's so weird, because if you think of any species of animal, including canids, wolves, and, and all that, when do you ever see a pack of wolves where the alpha one says, right, we're going off to hunt now, and they all go charging off into the sunset, going, oh, I'm going to go and stay with them, and oh, I'm going to go and join that pack over there, and I'm going to have a wonderful time, and I'll see you later. No, they all stay together. What is this thing with us and our dogs that we say the pack's going out for walk, and the dog says, well, you can, I'm out of here, and <laughs> off it goes. And we can't see, we don't see it again for half an hour. There is no other species that does that. Even canids among themselves don't do that. It's only when you mix people and dogs that you have this one where you take your dog out, and you say, we're going this way. And he says, I don't care. I'm going that way. And I'm not even going to look back. That's abnormal. So there's something going wrong in that relationship that says to the dog, you have to be different to every other social animal and do what you want. Don't be bothered about being with the group. And until you change that, you're not going to improve that recall. So people will pay fortunes often getting trainers to come out and try and improve its recall. They get a trainer to come and train it to recall. It's already trained to recall. It was trained to recall by the time it was 13 or 14 weeks old. When you called it, it knew what that meant. 
So you don't need a trainer. You need somebody to teach your dog to listen for what he's already been trained to do. So people keep getting trainer after trainer after trainer, trying to teach him something that he already knows. That's not the problem. The lack of recall is just a symptom. The problem is the dog doesn't believe it has to listen to you. So that's the key to fixing that. Wow. <laughs> And, and I think the thing is, though, very often owners are not actually aware that the problems are, are there in the home anyway. I think very often in the behavioural work that I do, until you actually have that conversation with somebody, they're not actually aware how the things in the home transpire, transfer is the word I mean, transfer to outside. Um, it's just like teaching kids, isn't it? You look at children, they're never disobedient just on one thing. There's a whole mentality in the child that says, I don't have to listen to my parent anymore. And there'll yeah. be a whole list of different ways that the child manifests that. But it's because there's a problem in that relationship where the parent says, time for bed, and the child says, I don't want to go to bed. Yeah. That's not a problem about bed. There's no problem I'm trying to fix that. The problem you're trying to fix is the relationship where when the parent says, time for bed, the child doesn't believe it has to listen. And it's exactly the same with the dog. 99% of the dogs that I'm called to see don't have training problems. They have listening problems. They're already trained do almost everything that the owner wants the dog to do just isn't doing it and what we have to look at is why he believes he doesn't have to and once you fix that then you can tra tra you can train those those things that you're trying to get those little fine details that you want to add in but we have to teach him to listen to the basics that he's already been trained to do that you is the golden at... nugget absolutely the golden nugget claire i couldn't have put it better myself <laughs> um Okay. Are there any other questions, ladies? Because, Gem, I think we're wrapping up shortly, aren't we? Yeah, I think as much as we'd like to keep Rob hostage and <laughs> ask questions all night, I think we should probably let him go. But well, like, like, anyone can get in touch if, if there's still some things that they didn't get covered. And I know we um, didn't cover all the questions that you said you wanted to ask, but by all means, get back in touch and I'll get those people to get in touch with me and I'll answer them. Okay. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Rob. Um, that's been really amazing. Thank you. You're always so inspirational to listen to when you speak. So Absolutely. thank you very, very much. <laughs> thank you all for listening. Thank you. Uh, thank you, ladies. I hope you've all enjoyed um, Rob's um, advice and top tips and the best tip and everything that he gave us tonight. <laughs> um, thank you for joining us and um, look forward to seeing you all again soon. Take care, guys. Thank you all very much. See you later. Bye. Bye. Bye.